looking at the agenda, we've got a, a brief introduction to, to ADRIS for, for those that, that don't know us, um, followed by an introduction into BIM, Building Information Modeling. We then move on to BIM for Manufacturing, showing then the BIM process, so looking at Revit families, the inventor to, to Revit link, um, and finally, just finishing off with, with how Idris can, can help you um, as a, an authorised uh, platinum reseller. We have numerous services to, to help. Uh, so we'll be coming on with that today. Just looking at a, a brief introduction into to Idris, uh, we're a multidisciplined platinum UK bar for Autodesk. Um, and we service the manufacturing, construction, and structures industry. Uh, being a platinum reseller puts us in the top 1% worldwide um, and we have to jump through several Autodesk coupes to achieve that. Um, as a business we're part of the Grey Tech Group which is a, a global company. They primarily supplied advanced steel and advanced concrete um, and what was interesting to see as, as Autodesk's growth in the BIM market is their re recent acquisition of the, the intellectual property of advanced steel and advanced concrete. So those two products are now part of the Autodesk portfolio. Um, we as a business work with some of the leading names in the industry, Zaha Hadid Architects, Schneider Electric and Pal Europe. Um, so we have a, a wide breadth of a, of a customer base. Um, and just a little bit about myself, I'm the Manufacturing Sales Manager at Address and I've been with the business um, approximately eight years. And over that time, what has been interesting to see is the, the growth of BIM, building information modelling. Um, we would assume to start with it was just a, uh, an ethos in the construction industry. But interestingly, what we've seen now is, is more and more manufacturers being asked to supply their content in a format that, that architects can use. Um, being able to supply it so that um, specifiers can, can easily get hold of it. So that the ongoing BIM 3D model has consistency. Um, and I think nowadays the construction industry are waking up to the value of, of 3D. Um, clash detection, helping projects to be delivered quicker, under budget and on time. Um, but for numerous manufacturers to be pulled into this with their 3D model data, which realistically manufacturers were creating 10 to 15 years ago, you know, that the 3D revolution happened some time ago for manufacturers, the construction industry is finally moving down that, that route. And it's become more apparent now that the government has stated that in 2016, projects over a certain size, be it 5 million to start with, must be done in a BIM format. Um, so we are being approached by, by numerous manufacturers asking, you know, how do we become compliant um, with what's going on in that industry. Um, and well, just, just a bit about me as well. Um, so obviously, as, as Gary introduced me, my, my name is Keith Dini. Um, I, I'm, I'm from an architectural background, so I'm, I'm here really to, um, to talk to you more about the kind of BIM side of things. Um, as, as part of Address, my, my title is uh, a BIM consultant, so I tend to deal with uh, architects mainly, um, but, but with other um, consultants as well, so Steelwork and, and MEP and so on. Um, but, um, but by trade, I'm, I'm from a, an, an architectural background, so I, I trained in architecture, um, been in the industry for, for sort of 10 years and more. Um, I've been Address now with uh, with Address for two years now, um, and I say my, my role really primarily sort of revolves around the kind of training and um, rolling out of, of BIM inside of practices. So um, a, a lot more sort of geared around the kind of implementation and execution of BIM on on projects and so on for for different um, companies that we work with. Um, also, uh, I'm currently studying. Um, an MSc as well in BIM, so we're, we're sort of trying to, as a company, keep up to, to date with all of the, the, the stuff that's happening with BIM. Obviously, things are moving on quite quickly with it, so um, sort of part of my role really is to try and keep up to speed with all of the um, all of the kind of documentation and changes that's happening centrally with government and so on. Um, and also, as part of that, I'm kind of active member of the the South BIM Hub as well. So um, regionally, the the central government have, have 
um, started up a initiation so that um, local governments can can have these little hubs of of meetings of, of BIM related people. So sometimes they're worth going along. Um, even from a manufacturer's point of view, I think it's it would be interesting to see it. Um, and you know, you could at least join in with, with other people and see where, where they're coming from from other consultants' points of view as well. So it's sometimes interesting just get a sort of overview. Um, so from my point of view, it's it's interesting to see how BIM is sort of affecting everybody else as well as you know how you're involved. So. Um, so really, um, as, as Gary said, sort of my part of this this presentation really is the kind of BIM side of things, the, the introduction to BIM, and I'm going to sort of lead on to a um, a kind of demo about um, the sort of BIM exchange side of things as well. Um, but firstly, I just wanted to talk about BIM itself, really, and, and where it comes from, why why we use it, what it is, um, what what it kind of does for us. Um, as some of you may be aware, the the, the central government um, strategy which is released year on year. Um, in, in 2011, the, 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 the construction strategy at that point was um, looking really at trying to save um, a, lot of, a lot of technology, um, use a lot of technology, so I say, to save um, a lot of time and, and, and money within inside of the, the building industry. Um, obviously, the documents and stuff that produced out of the, the construction strategy are quite lengthy, but this was one particular sentence that has been used by a lot of people um, since then to, to kind of basically sum up really what that, that strategy was about in 2011 and, and, and who it kind of affects. Um, obviously, you, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys read it, but um, really, I mean, what we're talking about here is the, the adoption of using BIM technology. So the adoption of using building information modeling technologies, processes, and really utilizing those as a kind of collaborative thing inside of the, the AEC environment. Um, the, the main area of that really was, was geared around, as, as Gary mentioned, um, capital projects of a, of a large size to start with. Um, the idea being that it was going to reduce carbon emissions and um, to get that reduction using BIM technology to do it. But as that sort of took hold really, that acted as a kind of catalyst to um, sort of work its way down the supply chain to a lot smaller um, businesses that are obviously involved in those capital projects. So although you might not be a contractor that's directly related, you might be a manufacturer or a supplier or um, something like that that's that's involved in one of those projects. So suddenly you'll then have to start getting involved in a process that you know seemingly wasn't really about before this. So um, the, the other thing as well is obviously you know BIM itself. Um, realistically, BIM is just an acronym. So um, in a little bit the same way as kind of CAD, um, you, you know, a lot of these industries love these acronyms, and you know they, they mean different things to different people, and, and that's really why I was sort of referring to CAD a little bit on, on this slide because with CAD, everybody uses the term CAD. Everybody knows what CAD is. Everybody does CAD stuff, but it's more a case that it's one of those things that automatically means different things to different people. You know, it's computer aided design, computer aided drafting. It, it really depends on what your kind of remit is. Depends on how how you might utilize CAD inside of your inside of your workplace. Um, BIM's a little bit the same, really. Um, building information modeling is the the general term that people understand BIM to mean. But um, you know, is it one building, several buildings? Is it several models? Is it one model? So. Um, Realistically as well, to me, BIM itself is more about the, the information that you're actually putting inside of a model. So it's not really necessarily just about, um, you know, the actual drawn data. I mean, certainly from a manufacturing point of view, um, it's more about the information that's being applied to each of those families, parts, you know, diff different things that's going to be applied into that building as it gets constructed sort of virtually inside of a computer. And it's more about the information that the metadata, as we tend to sort of refer to it these days, um, getting applied to those different parts so that then things can then get called out, scheduled, um, and, and people know what they do. do. So I think from our point of view, really, um, building information management is probably a better term, really, because it's managing that information and not just in a kind of three-dimensional drawn data or graphical way. Um, also, now we're kind of, um, as part of that strategy, sorry, let's go back to this slide again in a second. Um, as, as part of this strategy, the, the last little line on that is, is trying to sort of say that really we're kind of working towards all stages of a project life cycle. So what we're sort of gearing towards now really is, is moving away from just a building information model being something that's produced for design and construction, 
but also being something that's being produced for a project's life cycle. So it's being handed over post-construction and then the client, the owner of the building is then sort of looking after that and all those components that's inside of that building information model then being applied inside of it and, and being able to be utilized throughout the, the life cycle of that particular building. So again, I think from a manufacturer's point of view, we're kind of talking about stuff that, you know, things like windows, doors, component parts that are inside of a building model that has an owner, they can then pick on those different building parts and know part numbers when things are going to need to be replaced, who, who would the manufacturer be, the, the details of all of those. We tend to refer to that now as project lifecycle management. So again, it's another kind of acronym really, but, um, but again, it's really just talking about taking the building information model and then utilizing it through the lifecycle of a building. So acronyms aside, um, what, what do we actually know about um, BIM? Well, obviously, I mean, realistically, it's it's the same in manufacturing as as it is for, for architecture and AEC. Um, you know, it's, it's more about sort of digital prototyping, you know, building something in a kind of virtual environment and, and, and testing it, seeing how it works, maybe coming up with several options of, of the same sort of part. So again, from a manufacturing point of view, it's, you know, it could be about having several options for the same component part, so where you might have had several different drawings for something in, in 2D, um, you might be able to apply all of those parts into one sort of family or one manufactured part inside of a virtual system, and then that might be able to be applied into a, a construction project and then obviously be interrogated or, or applied in different ways, come up with several options for it. Um, 2D and 3D graphical information, well obviously yeah, it doesn't need to be necessarily 3D data, um, I mean we tend to refer to it as 3D, but um, you know, even just basic CAD can be BIM, um, it's more just how the information is being utilised and attached, so that's quite kind of part of the working process that people tend to adopt when they're, they're implementing BIM, we do tend to find that people tend to sort of do a stage by stage working with the systems that they already use, and, and we sort of tend to help them out to sort of starting to apply BIM technology and it's, it's very much a kind of stage by stage process working from finding CAD to, to then other programs to start adopting a more 3D based environment. Um, and, and so yeah, obviously design visualization as well, but again that, that sort of goes hand in hand with the manufacturer side of things as well. So obviously if, if I was an architect on a project and I wanted to apply something into the building, I wanted to specify something, um, I would obviously be going to a manufacturer's website hoping to be able to find a, a BIM family that I can use. But not only that, I would also want to put it into my building and then be able to visualize it, be able to look at that space and how that, that part that I'm putting in, whether it's a door or a window or, or something a lot smaller, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's all going to help build up that kind of visual picture as to how that, that space is going to look. Um, and then obviously, yeah, again, the virtual design and construction side of things. So obviously really as a manufacturer, you know, also being able to test, you know, all of those parts. And then eventually maybe we'll be able to use that, that information that you're producing from a specifying point of view um, for yourselves as well and obviously be able to then link it to you know, parts lists, cutting lists, an actual manufacturer of, of those parts as well as obviously being able to um, get the information out there for others to be able to use. Um, this was really just a quick slide just to show about the, the awareness of them. I mean, like Gary was saying earlier, you know, the initially even in the AEC environment, it wasn't really known as to whether BIM was going to be something that was actually going to take off um, or whether it was just a kind of nobody really knew sort of thing. Um, and is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? What are people going to do with it? Um, so I think this is quite a good look slide really just to sort of suggest how people's now awareness of BIM is changing and um, people are now adopting BIM. So obviously the topic there, you can see that obviously from you know, 2012 to sort of 2013, there's been more kind of confidence in the way that people understand what BIM is um, and, and how it's kind of utilised. And obviously, likewise, as well, the, the bottom part of the slide there that's sort of talking about how people are sort of projecting their usage of BIM. So, um, you know, all of these things are kind of increasing and it's all sort of gearing up to basically everybody now adopting BIM as a kind of standard, really. Um, so assuming that BIM is adopted, which obviously is, is the way that we're going, and, and most people are now adopting it fully, really, um, I think one of the biggest changes really is, is the kind of cultural change that people have when it comes to what they're actually producing. Um, and I think this sort of goes hand in hand, again, with, with manufacturers, really, because as it stands at the moment, 
Previously, people might have been producing very basic 2D stuff documentation and, and utilizing something like AutoCAD to be able to produce that. Um, it was all about the sheets that were being produced and the documents that were being produced, and, and people were then using those documents to, to obviously basically create a pack of drawings and a pack of information, an O&M manual and, and operations and maintenance manuals to be able to hand over um, at, at the end of a project construction. But now we're sort of finding that instead of the kind of CAD-based and, and discipline-based documentation that tends to get produced, um, Everything is now all based in one space in that kind of BIM model. So the, the BIM model is this big 3D sort of container um, that sort of holds all of that information. Everything gets applied inside of that, and, and that gets produced through the, the building system. And then things like documentation, the kind of drawings um, and specifications and all of the other bits and pieces that come out of it are all literally just parts of that building information model. They're all just one of the kind of byproducts, if you like, of actually creating a building information model anyway. So it's it's a bit of a distant, different approach than, than the, the kind of documentation-led CAD um, system, really. Um, so as part of this kind of adoption, um, the, the, there's, this, this slide is something that we'll, we put this slide in, really, because it's, it's one of those things that's used a lot in BIM presentations, and it's... It's a slide that's really used to try and explain the difference between something that's very 2D based, CAD based and kind of simplistic to something that's a lot more 3D based, detail based, information based, metadata, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and also a kind of collaborative system as well. Um, so this really is trying to explain using that government strategy that I was talking about before. Um, the government really want everybody to try and aim to be a, a level two BIM, as it's now referred to, by 2016. Um, well, that level two is really represented, obviously, here by the, that sort of red line that I put on here. Um, at the moment, a lot of companies are still down at sort of level zero, as it is on this little little schematic here. So, a lot of companies are still using CAD and, and doing very 2D based things. Um, so, what we're finding is now that people are now adopting it, moving into what would be sort of level one, moving sort of from 2D to kind of 3D. Um, and also start trying to do um, the bit underneath where it says lines, arcs, circles, and then model objects. You know, again, the sort of level one, level two, we're now sort of talking about instead of just basic line work, something being a kind of actual object, and that object contain information and data, you know, related to it. So I think from a manufacturing point of view, that's, that's what we're kind of talking about, is obviously trying to start creating those objects that are more intelligent than just a series of just lines and circles. Um, part of the other reason, obviously, for adoption, I think, from a, um, a manufacturing point of view, um, is really the kind of supply chain thing that I was talking about before. Obviously, with that construction strategy, even when that was referring to large-scale capital projects, um, obviously, those capital projects still had a lot of different suppliers supplying all the different bits and pieces that needed to be supplied inside of those buildings. So there was things being specified there's things that was going to go into that over there manual at the end um, in here that's all represented obviously by that sort of supply chain so all those little nodes that comes from the contractor led and design led teams um, all sort of feeds down to the very small little nodes of contractors subcontractors subconsultants um, and realistically all of those that kind of sort of push pull effect if you like um, on that supply chain is really requesting now that or expecting a degree of those different bits and pieces to be supplied in in kind of BIM. So, um, you know, to have families, to have objects created to make them BIM ready um, to then be supplied and specified inside of buildings makes it just obviously so much quicker um, and also makes it so much more likely that, that things would be um, automatically specified as well. So I think it's, it's really just that knock-on effect and that sort of catalyst, as I say, that Obviously, the supply chain now is, is beginning to be expected to sort of jump on board with this as well, not just the big contractors and the big designers. It's, it's everybody, really. So um, I think that's what we're, we're sort of finding now. Um, just to sort of move a bit more from general sort of BIM stuff, really, um, to, to something that's, that's more kind of geared around what you guys do, um, 
obviously we wanted to just sort of hone in a bit more on, on the, the manufacturing side of it and um, just talk about you know, the process that we find that people use at the moment. Um, really when it comes to sort of, as I say, starting to build up those objects, those kind of 3D objects, um, and trying to make them ready for, for specifying and, and putting into, into buildings. Um, so just got a couple of slides here just sort of explaining you know, some of the methods that people are adopting at the moment. Um, and as I say, we're, we're just going to do a little demo just to, to show you one of those processes as well. So um, the first way that we're finding is, is by using things like Inventor, um, which obviously Inventor is a, a great program for sort of bringing different file types into. Part of the difficulty with BIM is, is to make things available for people so that they can read it in all different softwares. Um, we, we tend to refer to it as interoperability. Um, it just means that something that you maybe create as a supplier um, or a manufacturer, I can then actually put into my building. There's no point in you creating something and me not being able to utilize it, or vice versa. So um, we find that people are using things like Inventor at the moment to kind of bring lots of different file types into to then be able to create families in the right way um, so that then they can be specified into buildings a bit more accurately um, at a later stage. So obviously this was really just to sort of show the kind of the solid edge and the cutters and the pro engineers and all that sort of stuff being brought into into invent to start creating parts. Guys, do you want to remember? Yeah, one one of the points I wanted to make there, Keith, is um, we've been into numerous um, competitive accounts um, that we've never really been able to speak to before. You know, that have been using SolidWorks, or they may use Pro Engineer, um, and what we're saying is that you do not necessarily have to have a complete swap out. You know, we're not swapping out what you currently have for the Autodesk Inventor software. Um, but what Autodesk have done really well is that they have a huge presence in the construction industry with, with AutoCAD. So um, whilst the government can't really stipulate what a BIM solution is, it's quite clear to see in industry that the, the Autodesk Revit software has um, been taken up quite considerably. And because Autodesk own Revit and because Autodesk own AutoCAD and they own Inventor, they've really enhanced the transition of data from one package to another. Um, so we are now talking to Pro Engineer and, and Solid Edge and, and Katia accounts because they don't necessarily have a direct linking to Revit, um, whereas Autodesk, you know, we know Inventor can open up a multitude of different file formats, and we're really using Inventor as a transitioning tool. So for a manufacturer that has spent a lot of time, spent a lot of um, money creating what we call an asset, a data asset, then the inventor link is really to reuse that data that you've already created. And, and, and Keith will show a little bit later how we simplify the data because at the end of the day, the, the architect is not interested in, in the level of detail manufacturers go down to. They are more interested in, in a visual type representation to, to put in their 3D model. Similar in a way, you may have already heard of features like shrink wrap you know, creating an assembly down to a single part, it's a similar process. So by this slide, we're not saying, you know, you have to swap out your software for, for Autodesk Inventor. What we're saying is that one of the processes or one of the steps that's available to you is to be able to import your existing data, use Inventor to simplify, and then transition that data through to Revit because there is a really strong link from Inventor through to Revit. Thank you. That's right. um, so yeah, I mean that that was um, that was going to kind of lead on to the the other part. I was just going to say about um, so obviously as Gary was saying, I mean yeah, obviously Inventor is, is a very sort of powerful tool about you know pulling in all those different file types, but it's also got some um, some quite unique little tools as well when it comes to converting things like two D into three D as well. Um, so at the moment we're finding that a lot of people are historically were only using two D information. Um, are then pulling that information in, converting it into sort of more 3D based information that again then can be used in, inside of a building um, in a kind of building information modeling environment. Um, maybe going into Revit, maybe not necessarily, you know, it, it can just be um, just actually literally just changing that and converting that, that information out from a 2D to a 3D base. 
Um, the other thing we're also noticing as well is that a lot of manufacturers irrelevantly invent a thing for a minute really. Um, a lot of manufacturers have a lot of kind of shop drawings that they might have had historically in, in 2D, um, which again, like I was saying, you know, we're, we're not just talking about inventor here, we're, we're talking about anything really. Um, but we can now start using that information and start pulling that in to create um, BIM families. When we refer to families, I, I tend to be assuming that we're talking about Revit. Um, Revit uses families, and in this case, you can see the sort of 3D door there. So that 3D door would be a family, um, and that would be, as the, the image shows there, that's in Revit. Um, and that door would then be ready for an architect or a specifier or whatever to then place into, um, into a, a model ready to use. The difference really being that we can take all of that information that's in those basic 2D drawings, and we can bring all that information into that 3D model, and it's going to look like a door in the 3D sense, but it's also going to contain all that, that information as well. So um, it's starting to, to sort of build up, like, like we were saying earlier, you know, kind of intelligent objects ready to be used in, in the kind of BIM environment. So at the moment, we're finding that, uh, you know, a lot of manufacturers are starting to look at that kind of process. And then lastly, um, for, for what we're sort of going to lead on to from the demo side of it, which is what, um, what, what Gary was just mentioning then, is that um, once you've got something inside of Inventor, that there's a, there's a strong you know, link between that and, and what we can do inside of Revit. Um, so there's, a, there's an exchange route, basically, between um, you know, creating something that's Inventor, um, pulling it into Revit, and bringing across some of that information that comes with it. So um, this is just a quick little slide showing um, what one of our, uh, one of our customers, um, which is Snyder Electric, and what we've done for them is we've taken a lot of their their information that they've got in both 2D and 3D um, and translated it through Inventor, um, simplified it for Inventor, which is say, as, as, as Gary said, was, is the you know the, the, one of the main processes really because the some of the Schneider you know electrical boards and things like that have got a, a lot of information on, um, but from a AEC environment point of view, you don't need all that information. You just need to understand where the connections are or how it's going to look or you know maybe just a few parts of that kind of data information that comes through. So, um, so yeah, we, we've gone through the process of bringing it in, simplifying it, creating those components ready to then be placed in. So they've still got the manufacturing side of it, which they can then utilize in-house, but then they've also got the ability to um, broadcast and then make available to specifiers that sort of simplified 3D Revit type family for them stakeholders or, or other um, suppliers or whatever to, to then specify inside of models. Um, just before we just before we um, move on to the, the little demo that we were going to do, um, I just wanted to mention about um, level of detail as it's kind of sort of getting referred to these days. Um, level of detail, without getting too bogged down with it, I mean it was really just to try and understand a little bit more about when something's being specified and placed into a building, um, so creating those families, what's actually being created and, and, and what's being seen and, and how is that information being used. So level of detail um, and level of development, which are kind of one in the same thing really, um, or LOD as they tend to get referred to, um, is really trying to start to understand how much data is, is being put into those different objects that are being created. So from a manufacturing point of view, um, the little um, graphic there showing the chair um, is a kind of prime example, really, that you'd have these different levels of detail. And from a specifier, at an early stage in a project might not necessarily need to know the exact component that you're placing in. It might just be quite, you know, quite rough, quite sketchy. Um, but then as you sort of build up a project, you would need to start knowing more and more information. And then by the sort of G2, the, the level two there, um, you might know the manufacturer, but again, you might not need to know something that's all sort of fully renderable, you know, create visuals out of all of that sort of stuff. And you might not necessarily have to have a family that's got as much detail, you know, built inside of it. So you would tend to go through a process of substitution as you create a project. So from a manufacturer's point of view, I think what, what I'm sort of leading to really is that a lot of manufacturers now are starting to produce families with different aspects in them so that different levels of detail can be shown at different parts inside of a project. So you might be able to take a section out or 
a plan or a schedule and it contained different parts of details as, as the buildings sort of being developed. In a similar way, um, as I say, this is level of development, which is basically a similar thing. Um, this is really being adopted a lot more by manufacturers now as, as a standard. The AIA level of development standard is, is the one that the manufacturers are using as a kind of baseline is what we're finding. So um, the idea of this really is that manufacturers are looking to the specifications that this details and basically then you can produce a family, you can produce an object and stipulate that it is to a level of detail like LOD 400 or 300 or whatever. And the idea being that then a specifier would know exactly what that means. They would know what is expected in, in that component, what parts they're going to see, whether they can visualize it or not, whether they can schedule it or not. Um, so these levels of detail are really just trying to help both you, us and everybody else kind of communicate with each other what's expected out of those different parts that we're kind of creating. Um, lastly, I just wanted to mention about the, um, the compatibility as well. Um, obviously, like Gary was saying earlier, I mean, things like Inventor are being used as a, as a good program to kind of bring stuff through. Um, but what we're finding really from a, a manufacturer's point of view is that there's kind of three data formats that people are utilizing. Um, did you want to... Yeah, I mean, for a manufacturer looking to export their data in a format that architects can use, it comes down to three file types predominantly. Um, the .dwg, uh, 3D DWG, um, because we know of the strength of AutoCAD and Autodesk in the marketplace. Um, a .rfa file format is a Revit family. So this is the primary file for that, that that most manufacturers are now trying to um, create. It's the .rfa. Um, from direct in Inventor, we have the ability to save as uh, an RFA file. Um, the other file format out of Inventor is a .adsk file. And those are really the two files that, that Revit will, will import. Um, they will open up. Um, so it's the .rfa, the Revit family file which is, is the most important. Um, for exchange in the construction industry, they have a, a .ifc file, which is an industry foundation class file. That's taken into account that in the industry, there are other BIM solutions, um, Bentley MicroCAD, Vectorworks, ArchiCAD. They all have their, their own BIM solutions. So the IFC file is, is in our terms, similar to an IGES file or a SAP file. It's, it's a common file that we can use to exchange data to other CAD packages. Um, primarily though, we, we, which I'll come on to a little bit later, when creating families, it's the .rfa file that, that, that most um, manufacturers are looking to achieve and, and supply. Yeah, I think, um I mean, the IFC bit, I think the only reason that sort of put it up there really is because um, from a BIM point of view, so sort of more from my point of view, really, um, we're sort of, IFC really refers to the whole building project, if you like, whereas the, the Revit family files and the DWG files, they more refer to those individual parts or those individual drawings that, that manufacturers might be producing that's then going to be built into that, that sort of BIM project as it goes. Um, IFC also um, is part of what's called COBE as well, or conversely, COBE really is a, is a part of IFC. So COBE is a, a subset of IFC. Um, IFC in its basic format just based, uh, takes the, the BIM project down to basic computer coding language, um, which means that therefore it can obviously then be translated, as Gary said, between different you know, software vendors and so on. Um, what Kobe does is basically takes that computer language and then exports it out into um, an Excel kind of spreadsheet format. The idea really of this is that sort of leading more towards the project lifecycle management side of things that we, I, I was alluding to earlier. Um, so the idea being that as a manufacturer, you might have a, a part, a family that's being built. Um, it's being put into a, a building information model and then that model is then being handed over at the end of the construction process for the client or the owner to then 
take through to project lifecycle management. They would then be able to use that COBE data that's inside of that. They wouldn't need necessarily Revit or Inventor or any of those kind of packages. They could just literally take that information out into Excel, have that information they're ready to use, and they would then be able to know what those parts have inside of them in the sense of data. So they would know, you know, things like um, serial numbers, part numbers, system numbers, who was it created, when it needs, you know, updating, when it might need changing. Um, so it just means that asset that, that they're placing inside of that building, they know everything about it without necessarily having to utilize, you know, a building information modeling software to be able to use it. Where we're seeing the value of, of the information part within a Revit family is a manufacturer doesn't really influence too much the upfront design and build of a project um, to a certain extent. But many manufacturers that supply to the industry, um, we, we're seeing now that the ongoing FM scenario is where a lot of this content with the information behind it is becoming invaluable. So behind every family we have like property cards and that property card will have certain information. Um, for example, if I'm a lighting manufacturer, manufacturer's name, part number, um, warranty, um, light bulb fitting, manufacturer of who supplies the, the bulbs, even all the way down to if it's electrically fed, you know, is it 240, 415 fed? Um, so it's putting all of this information in. One of the questions that I often get asked is, you know, what information do we attach? You know, is, is there a set standard? Um, and the honest answer is, you know, it's whilst there are people out there that are trying to uniform at a certain standard, it's very hard to achieve. Um, and there is no right or wrong answer as to the information you attach to your family. You may often find that the main contractor or the owner of the building may specify this at the front end stage, which will mean that your families may develop and, and continue to develop on an ongoing basis. Um, the manufacturers that I look after, they will adopt a license of, of Revit themselves internally um, and Autodesk offer two versions, Revit Lite and, and full Revit. Um, and you would want to adopt this internally so that you can maintain and create and develop and change Revit families as time goes on. Um, in the construction industry, you know, there is a new version of Revit released each year. So you would want to make your Revit family compatible to the version of Revit the architect is using. Um, so we often find that this information adding process is a continual process. Um, and there is no right or wrong as to what information you attach. But there are some standard templates and, and with guidance from Address that we can we can assist and show you, you know, at a starting point. Yeah, and I mean, just leading off from that, we are, we are finding that Kobe is, is being adopted now as, as quite a kind of industry standard um, for um, more from the sort of client side of things, really, as, a, as an employer, as an owner of a building. They are now starting to look to, to things like Kobe, um, as Gary said, for that sort of FM side of it, really to start beginning to understand how that might be used um, and then looking that, for that information to be automatically with inside of the, um, the Revit families as the, the building model is, is being produced. Um, so I just wanted to um, just quickly show you a, a quick demo for um, sort of Inventor to, to, to Revit, really. Um, the, the idea of this really was just to give you a quick um, overview as to, to how we might um, pull something from Inventor into, into Revit. So just for the purpose of this, um, I've got a, this is obviously Inventor that we're looking at here. We've got a, a little Inventor file. Um, there's nothing special about this Inventor file. I haven't done anything particular with it. Um, it's just a very simple Inventor file just to make the, the process that I'm showing you a little bit easier. Um, but obviously the Inventor file itself could be as complicated as we want it to be. Part of this process really is to, to then start simplifying this Inventor file um, and the, the details that we might have inside of this. So normally what we tend to do is go through the process of, of simplifying this object. For the purpose of this demonstration, this is just um, 
uh, a light, um, which is a, a ceiling light, so dropped into a kind of ceiling grid, the normal sort of bog standard commercial um, type ceiling grids. So um, as I say, it's a fairly basic component. You know, it, it is a little bit detailed. There are a few aspects to it which is a little bit detailed, but in essence, it's it's a fairly basic part. Um, so the first thing we might go through as a process would be the simplification process, um, which which Gary sort of mentioned earlier, um, with things like the sort of shrink wrap and kind of filling holes and removing internal voids and all that sort of stuff. That as a process is a very complex one um, and really depends on on what the part is. Um, but um, if I just go to simplify here, we can see that obviously we can do lots and lots of different things to, to simplify the components. Um, I'm not going to bother with this one because obviously this is a very simple component anyway, so it should be fine to exchange anyway. Um, but assuming for a minute that we'd gone through that, that process of simplification, um, and that would be something that you might need to sort of have a chat with us and see how we can kind of go about that. Um, can I just add there, Keith? Yeah, yeah. Whilst we're showing this simplification process, this is taking into account the existing data that you've created. So if you do use SolidWorks or Solid Edge or any competitive package, you can reuse that data, bring it into Inventor Simplify and pop it to Reddit. On the other side, you don't necessarily have to have Inventor to be able to create Revit families. Um, some customers will just purchase Revit solely and recreate the data from scratch. Um, Revit in itself is a, is a 3D parametric modeler. And when we talk about levels of detail, we are talking relatively simple designs. Um, so sometimes it is just quicker to create it from scratch inside a Revit. Um, but this process here is, is if you wanted to reuse your existing data. Yeah, and I mean, really, this is um, obviously to then be able to take that simplified data that you, you, you're then using outside of Inventor um, to, to bring it into, into Revit. So part of the, the, the process really that I wanted to just quickly show you was um, that we've got a, an exchange system here. Um, that when I bring that up, obviously we have the ability to shrink wrap the substitute. So obviously what, what Gary was mentioning earlier. So even at this point, I could still start simplifying things if I do need to. Um, so obviously I could then create a whole new part um, and that could be a nice simplified one without an external void, uh, internal voids in and, and all the other other parts inside of it. Um, I can also be adding things like connectors and stuff so that when this goes into create a Revit family, um, it can have different connectors onto it so that it could be made part into a, a, a system straight away. Um, so that Schrader Electric distribution board that I, I showed you earlier, um, you know that that would have had the electrical connectors already applied to that to then be able to give the inputs and outputs of, of the, um, the electrical system that it can be applied to. So um, just a couple of other things that you might be doing. Uh, we might also be checking the, the UCS. Um, so just to make sure that this is going to sit in the right space once we create it as a family. The one that this has got on it is, is fine anyway, but as you can see on there, I can just literally just place one down or I can specify it at a certain point. That's really to make sure that this little family works um, once it gets inside of Revit, as we might want it to. Um, and at any point, we can just check the design to make sure that the component that we're going to pull into Revit isn't going to be too complex. So obviously, when we create a family, that family is going to be a certain file size. And all we're trying to do here is to make this little object simple so that when we create that family, it's not going to create a file size that's huge, because obviously, this is going to be build up, building up inside of a project over and over again. And obviously, we want something that's going to be quite small. So it will do this design check. It will stick a little tick by all of these parts to make sure that there's you know, nothing too over the top. If, them, if something is a bit over the top, it will put a little cross next to it, flush it up, and say that it's, you know, it's too complicated. Um, maybe try and simplify it further or, or remove any other voids or whatever that's in there. Um, once we're kind of ready to, to then, or we think we're ready to export it, um, we can then start creating the, the, the part. Um, at the moment, this is going to take it out as an ADSK file, which is what Gary was saying earlier, so that this sort of autodesk exchange file. This just basically means because I've got Revit open already, I can then just pull it straight into Revit, and it'll open it straight away as an exchange file. Um, as part of this process, I can start stipulating what this part is, so I can start saying, you know, in this case, I've already 
pre-designated this as a piece of lighting, but obviously in here I can see that I can put what we call omniclass numbers. So start designating it as an actual part and an actual piece of equipment once it gets inside of a, a, a Revit project. Um, and obviously there's lots of different choices that we've got there from a, a manufacturer's point of view. Um, and we can also add our own sort of personal data as well if we want to, which, which sits under this identity data category here. Um, so we can put in there a manufacturer, a model number, part number, um, as well as obviously we can add um, you know, various other different bits and pieces. Um, and even at this stage, we can still do a, a design check if we need to, to, to make sure that everything's as we might want it to be. Um, so assuming that we've, we've put any, anything that we want to additionally into this, we can then say, yeah, that's okay. So create that out. Um, it will save it out for us. Um, and obviously, as you can see, it's saving it as an ADSK file. And as, um, as Gary said earlier, we, what we could do then is we could obviously um, also create it as a, um, as a sort of a, a family file, so a .rfa file as well if we wanted to straight from, um, from Inventor. So that's kind of the Inventor bit sort of done really. Um, for the purposes of this demo, I've just got a, a very quick little Revit project. So we're in Revit here. Um, so I've just got some basic walls um, and, a, and a floor and so on. Um, so nothing sort of too complicated. Um, if I just go to 3D so we can just see that obviously we've got something fairly basic in here. Um, I've got a ceiling here and a floor. So I pulled that component in. Um, at the moment I might be I might not see it straight away because I'm on the wrong view. So obviously I was on a floor plan there. So if I go to something like a, a ceiling plan, I can see my ceiling grid there. And it should be on the component now. I should be able to place that component down. And it should, yeah, so there's my, my ADSK come in. And I should now be able to place that down. As soon as I place it down, obviously we can see it's it's a light fitting. It's come in looking like a light. Obviously it's slotted itself into my ceiling for me there. And if I pick on it, I can see if I go to edit type, it will bring in a load of that data that I've, I've now supplied into it. So in here, I can see I've got things like the, the model number and the part number that was part of that inventor exchange. Um, also, because it's it's an actual family, it's going to add a load more extra data inside of there for me. I'll go to the family itself in a second, and we can just have a look at that. But um, we can see where all of this stuff's coming from. But at the moment, obviously, it's creating it as a family, and I've now pulled that family into a project. So if I was to go to 3D again for a second, I'd be able to see that light sitting in my in my ceiling there. If I just go to it as a family for a minute, so this is the actual part that's been created. So this is the ADSK file, or as we can see up here now, it's a Revit family file um, that's now been created. Because it's a light, um, it's got the addition of a light source on it. So you can see I've got a light source ticked here. Um, but all these different things, it's, it's the same as that um, electrical component bits that I was speaking about earlier. So I can do things like add connectors to it and all that sort of stuff. So I could do it from the inventor side of it if I wanted to, um, the part I showed you before, the BIM exchange, or I could do those sorts of bits um, inside of Revit. And I think, you know, Gary will kind of agree is that what we're finding at the moment is that people approach it from two different ways. They either do a kind of inventor part and then simplify it from inventor and then end up with something quite simple inside of Revit, or they kind of start building something um, inside of Revit as a family, and then sort of start adding the details to it inside of Revit. Yeah, we, we, we have, I mean, there, there are two versions of Revit. You've got Revit Lite, and there's full Revit. And if you're creating families natively inside of Revit, it's worth just mentioning some of the limitations between Revit Lite and full Revit. Mm. One of the things Keith and I were, were looking at the other day was um, electrical fittings. Um, all electrical fittings have a, a electrical contacts where maybe a conduit may be connecting or, or a cable tray may be connecting, for example. One of the limitations in, in Revit LT is, is if you're creating the family from scratch, you do not have the ability to add connectors in Revit LT. 
um, you do have the ability to add connectors in, in full Revit. Obviously on the screen we're looking at full Revit here so we can see we've got the connectors up. Another option for adding connectors is, is within Inventor. Keith showed earlier on that Inventor also has some, the ability to add connectors. And, and connectors are quite important because if you think about the process you know, as, as a manufacturer, you would want to identify a, a connection point so that when you give it to the, the M&E guys and they bring their family into their 3D model, the M&E guys are routing cables, they're routing piping, um, whatever it may be, they're going to want to connect to, to something on the family. And as a manufacturer, when you're supplying your information, you would want to add this information to that family. So it's just an important point to, to note that um, Revit LT, although cheaper in price, does have its limitations. And if you're creating families from scratch, then uh, this is one of the limitations where you can add, cannot add connectors. That would have to be full Revit. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, there is obviously other limitations to the software, but I mean, certainly from a manufacturing point of view, I think from a um, family creation, that, that's probably the main one. Um, other than that, really, when it comes to creating families, LT is actually pretty good, um, and, and you can generally create most of the normal geometry that you'd create inside of a, a full Revit. Um, I say, obviously, we're using full Revit here at the moment, but um, you know it doesn't really differ that much um, when it comes to the general family creation. So um, the, the last thing I just wanted to say was obviously, yeah, obviously we've got the, the the part here, and as part of this family, we can obviously see that we've got all of this um, metadata that I was talking about earlier that's, that's sort of built into this. So any of these parts are just you know fields that I can kind of change around. Um, this is just as it's come in, really. It's, it, I've, I've not really done anything special with this, um, so it, it's literally just a you know a case that we can obviously start typing in all of these different bits and pieces, and also from the identity data side of it, um, there might be actual parts that you want as a manufacturer placed in there. So obviously we've got our, our manufacturer's details, and what we're finding from companies like the, the the Schneider one that we was looking at earlier is that they want a quite a, a comprehensive list of um, different part numbers and codes and manufacturer's codes and stuff placed inside of that. So then eventually obviously we, we've got this inside of our um, inside of our project so that then we can then obviously bring that into our project and, um, and start creating sort of different renders and stuff so I've just sort of offset them to create a, um, a, a set of them here um, and obviously now that they're all in, the, in, in that environment so I could then start scheduling them off and, and using them inside of a Revit project. All right, um, I'll just go back to the PowerPoint for a second. Um, I think there was just a couple of things that Gary just wanted to speak about at the end. Here. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, I'm conscious we've got about five minutes to go before the, the hour's up, so I'll run through this part. Um, I regard this part as, as um, one of the most important parts, really, because there is a lot of information out there when it comes to BIM and it's identifying who the, the right person is to, to help you. Um, we as a business, we have been supplying Autodesk CAD software, Inventor, AutoCAD. Believe it or not, Revit's been out 12, 15 years now, so it is nothing new um, other than the BIM process. But we as a business, as I mentioned earlier, are a platinum Autodesk reseller. Um, so our primary is we, we, we supply CAD software, but in this day and age that, that's not enough and um, we, we've set up other areas of the business. Uh, we have professional services, programming, we can supply hardware, we have IT support as well. Breaking each of those down briefly, um, our professional services is really where BIM is playing a big part um, and we can help you in one of two ways. We have the ability to do 2D and 3D content creation, so we can take your data for, from you, um, be it SolidWorks, be it AutoCAD, be it 2D or 3D, and we can do the process for you, so we can hand you back the Revit families um, on a consultative basis. We can include certain information into those Revit families. So we can get you onto the first one of becoming BIM compliant and being able to supply your data in a BIM format. Um, the other way to, to adopt in BIM really is, is through adopting the software yourself. 
um, and adopting the training yourself, which again we can supply. But we do find, you know, that um, the process varies from one person to another. You may want to reuse your existing data, or you may want to to create from scratch inside of Revit. But that's a bit of a learning process. Um, and like with the recent job we've done for, for Schneider Electric, who, who used Pro Engineer, is they commissioned Address to do the first 200 models, um, to understand the best processes and techniques, for the intent for Schneider to adopt an internal BIM team themselves, that they would then take the responsibility on. But because we've done the first set of models, we can then train you and give you the best guidance based on your product and your product information. Um, some of the other services in that department, this list is by no means exhaustive, but um, we, we have a design and visualization team, so we can create really stunning high-end visualizations for customers using 3ds Max. We have subcontract and permanent CAD sourcing, so, so we can supply staff to sit on site with you and work on live projects. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot that we, we can offer in our, our professional services team. Um, just mentioning quickly, as I did earlier on Schneider, this is a job we've been commissioned to do recently for all of their distribution boards. Um, they've given us the primary products to do first, with the intent that they will take on responsibility. In the programming department, uh, we, we've worked with some of the leading names in, in, in the retail sector with Next, um, British American Tobacco, Paul and Paul Vair that are in the, the, the filtration industry. I won't go into too much detail on this because today is about BIM, but um, as a partner, it's important to know that you know we don't just supply CAD and, and we don't just do 2D and 3D content creation. We also have an internal programming team. So if you do adopt the software and you, you ever wanted it to do something that the software was not designed to do, um, then our internal program t programming team can write apps, can write programs to help automate your tasks further. Um, now, we do supply a lot of hardware ourselves. We're, we're HP Gold Partners. Um, and if you're looking to adopt the software yourselves, um, be that Revit or possibly Inventor, we'll, we'll put the two in the same category in terms of hardware spec. But you really want to be looking at the, the HP Z420. Um, apologies there, I can see it says 240. But in fact, it is the HP Z420, which is the most common workstation that we supply for people that are going to create BIM content. Um, this is a workstation that has 16 gig of RAM, it has a Xeon processor, and it has either the NVIDIA K2000 or the K4000. Most cases we supply have the K2000 card. So this is what we would deem a, a common workstation. For AutoCAD it's slightly less, it's the Z230, but for any 3D type of work we generally supply the Z420. Um, and then they're quite affordable these days. Hardware has come down quite considerably over the years. And you can pick one of these machines up for about uh, just short of £1,500. Um, so the technology has come down quite considerably in cost over the last couple of years. I think it's one thing that people forget as well, isn't it, when they start adopting software, is you know the hardware needs to, to sort of work with it as well. Yeah, I mean, for, for most manufacturers that have gone 3D, you probably already appreciate you know some of the system requirements that are required um, for those that are, are new or for those that do adopt Revit themselves then you know th th this is where we need to be aiming at is, is a 420 and this will certainly safeguard you for the next three to four years and finally we, we, we have internally an IT support team so we, we can help with um, server configurations and support we can supply servers as well as has workstations and we supply printers and plotters. Um, but as part of the IT support, we can help with backup monitoring and we can do daily or weekly backups for you. Um, desktop support, things like antivirus and, and, and gaming a virus, things like that we can help with. Office 365 implementation and, and general all-round infrastructure support, configuration of, of routers, plotters, etc. So, 
an insight into our as a business, you know, as a platinum bar, we, we've had to set up these additional services um, and support offerings that, that go beyond just the CAD supplier. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, I think we've hit the, the hour mark or, or just over the hour mark yeah. there on there. Um, if you uh, want any further information, about, I suppose before I go then, I've, I've put my email address and Keith's email address there. So if you wanted to take a note of our email addresses, by all means, pop us an email with, with any questions.